Hola YouTube from San Antonio, Texas. This is Dr. Mark Havercorn with River City Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. Today we're going to be placing that implant right there, a Nobel Active 3.0, in this space. That's a congenitally missing tooth number 10, the lateral incisor. Here's another view. In these cases, the jawbone is always very thin. This patient had already undergone two surgeries from their general dentist trying to rebuild that bone. The patient was referred to me after both of those surgeries failed. I made an incision in the upper left gums and removed a small block of bone from the patient's cheek about three months ago and then put it at number 10 with a single screw that you'll see in a minute. Let's set aside the bone grafting issues and talk about implants for a minute. This patient has a peg lateral tooth number seven. That's the mirror image lateral incisor on the other side and you can see that tooth is very small. The space for number 10 is actually a normal sized space. So the patient's gonna have a small natural tooth number seven and then a normal sized fake tooth number 10. Now with anterior implants, you would like the implant to come straight out through what we call the cingulum of the tooth. I've marked the cingulums with those gray circles. So if each of those teeth was a fake tooth and the implant came right out where I put those gray circles, it would be perfect. I'm also trying to show you here that because tooth number 10 is bigger than number seven, the implant needs to be closer to the palate than it would have been for that small number seven. In this picture, you can see sort of the shape of what number 10 would look like based on the implant as I drew it. Next, let's talk about the vertical positioning of these implants. Ideally, you would like the implant to be three millimeters apical, below or above, whatever you want to say, the adjacent CEJ. The CEJ is the cemento-enamel junction of the tooth. It's the edge of the crown of the tooth. Also, at the same time, you want the implant to be seven millimeters above the contact area of the adjacent teeth. So the implant needs to be seven millimeters away from where the natural teeth are going to contact the implant crown. All right, enough talk. Let's start surgerizing. So here I'm just giving the injections. Don't worry, this video is sped up like three or four times faster than I would normally do this. And yes, the patient has been sedated. I know his eyes are open here a little bit. You'll see throughout the video that his eyes are generally closed as that sedation takes more effect and the patient doesn't remember those injections. So a lot of this video is shown um, at like one and a half or two times normal speed. So just don't worry, it's not always that fast and aggressive. Anyway, I made the incision. Now here I am lifting the gums up to expose the uh, screw that's holding the bone graft in. I've got to get rid of that screw so that I can put an implant through the bone without hitting the screw. All right, let's speed this thing up a little bit and let me get to the screw. So there it is, you can start to see the screw. It's sticking out of the bone a little bit because originally I left it sticking out of the bone on purpose and packed particulate bone graft around it and tried to grow even more bone. So the particulate graft failed just like the particulate graft that the dentist used, but you can see the block of bone from the cheek there, and that bone succeeded, and that will allow us to get an implant in there. I'm kind of showing you the outline of the bone block right there. So we'll remove that screw, and then we'll get the implant in. That little piece of gauze is there to keep the patient from swallowing the screw if I accidentally drop it. And here I am just using a regular old screwdriver to get it out. I mean, it's a brand-specific screwdriver, but it's no different than a screwdriver you buy at the store. Kind of a machine screw, nothing special. I chose the Nobel Active 3.0 implant because it is the narrowest diameter implant that I'm comfortable using. If you're going to put in a three millimeter implant, you want at least a six millimeter thick piece of bone to put it in, at least a millimeter and a half of bone on each side, and even that's cutting it kind of close. We have that amount of thickness though, so we can get the implant in. Now I'm going to start placing the actual implant. I just use a standard dental handpiece. It looks like the same drill that your dentist would use and some little tiny drill bits to make a hole in the bone. Obviously you want to center that uh, hole between the two natural teeth as best as possible and then center it within the thickness of bone that you have. And what you're going to see is that we're just using progressively thicker diameter, wider diameter drill bits to make that hole bigger. Um, because the implant's so small, there's really only a couple of drill bits that you have to use. A bigger implant would require more drill bits as you step up and increase the diameter of the hole.
This thing is a little paralleling pin that all the implant companies include in their kits. It's just a pin that you can put in the hole that you drilled to show you the angle and position of the implant and make sure you're happy. And you can see here it's centered in the bone and it's centered between the teeth and I'm happy with the position. This implant will be perfectly restorable. And it's centered between the teeth. Now I'm going to use a tap just to thread this implant hole. I don't always do this, but in a case like this where if that buckle bone, that bone graft block that I put in there, if that thing breaks off, it's going to ruin my day and make everybody cry. I'm going to go ahead and tap the hole so that when the implant goes in, it puts less pressure on that grafted piece of bone and decreases the chance of ruining the day. Um, I'm using a... Um, like a screwdriver to do this. You can put that tap in the hand piece that I was using earlier and do it electrically, but I like to tap it manually, uh, just going very slow and gentle. Now I'm loading up the implant and we're going to go put this in the patient. Here it is coming out of the package and that's what the implant actually looks like. It's made out of titanium alloy. It's about 90% titanium and about 10% other additives. Uh, recently I had a patient with a nickel allergy um, this type of alloy does not have nickel, um, at least not nickel that's added. If you can find any nickel in it, it's just because it's a, a very trace amount, like a tiny amount that's um, irrelevant to an allergy. So we place the implant electrically with the handpiece uh, because you don't have to worry about my hand wobbling as I put it in. It runs very slow and we irrigate it so that it doesn't heat up the bone as it goes in. And there it is. Uh, you like to put that implant it flush with the bone or sometimes even a little bit deeper. But you can see it's in there, it's flush with the bone. The bone graft, that block of bone, is still there. It didn't fall off. The day's not ruined. The implants have threads on the outside, as you saw, but they're also hollow and have threads on the inside. Uh, the internal threads are where we attach the post that sticks through the gums. That's called an abutment. That's what the crown goes on. So for right now, I'm putting a cover screw into the implant. It's just a little flat screw that threads into the implant, closes the hole so nothing gets in there, and then we're going to let it heal. Here's a diagram showing you the bone block and the implant, just kind of showing you exactly what you're looking at. Now I'm going to begin closing the case. I'm using a 4-0 chromic gut suture on a cutting needle, and yeah, I know you've heard me a million times say that I'm not a big fan of cutting needles. For a case like this, where there's not any tension on the wound and it doesn't require much to close it and my stitches are going to be in the attached gingiva. I don't have a problem using a cutting needle here. Um, so that's what I'm closing with and you'll see me I'm just going to hand tie. This is called a one-handed tie and I'm using my finger to push that stitch all the way down to be sure it's tight. Uh, that's the best way to do it. You don't want to just pull the ends of the string with your um, hands way away from the knot and try to slip it down. You want to use your finger to push it down. I'm going to fast forward through the rest of the sutures because you get the point. Okay, I'm just about done suturing. We're going to let this heal for two to three months, and then we're going to come back and put an abutment inside the implant. And that's the post, like I said, that threads down into the implant and sticks through the gums. That's the post that the crown goes on. So let's just review the case. Here's the pre-op photo. Here's the implant in place and, and another view of the implant in place. Um, here's the wound all closed just so you can see it. Here's what I said would be the ideal position of the implants. Here's the fake tooth drawn on that ideal position. Here's the final position of the implant. Remember that we wanted it three millimeters below the adjacent um, CEJs and seven millimeters below the adjacent contacts. I hope this video has been useful to you. Thanks for watching. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share. And if we can help you, give us a call at River City Oral Surgery, 210-778-0002. Thank you.